passage that we'll be looking at today is uh, James chapter 2. Yes, we finally will get there uh, or have gotten here. James chapter 2 verses 1 through 13. So if you want to be turning to that, that would be great. James has been teaching that those who have been born again are to be doers of the word and not just hearers only. If we only hear the word, we deceive ourselves, James said in chapter 1, verse 22. But I've been helped by a commentator who writes this. What does doing the word really mean? Well, many times we want to equate hearing the word with doing the word. We say things like, well, I came to church, I sang the songs, I bowed my head when someone prayed, I listened to the sermon, I even learned something from time to time. I am good for the week now because I did all those things. And this is not the right attitude, of course. James says merely hearing is not doing. But it's also easy to equate talking and teaching even from my standpoint, with doing the Word. We live in a day that it's so easy to have a thought and immediately pull out a device, type it in, and press that blue button with the up arrow, and off it goes. I confess I do it at times. Or maybe someone else makes a comment and I see it, and I think of a great response. See, I still get in trouble for talking too much. And the comments or the responses may even be about the Bible or church or some great doctrine. But if my attitude is demonstrating what I know and talking about it being more important to me than actually doing the word, then I might be deceived in thinking that merely talking is equivalent to doing the word. Listen to James in the final verses of chapter 1 as he sets up the context for our passage in chapter 2 today. Go back with me to verse uh, 26 and 27 of chapter 1. You can just follow along. Listen to this because it really matters what James says here. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. It might come as a surprise to you today that the word religion rarely is spoken in the Bible at all. It's a word, in fact, that only shows up four or five times in all of the New Testament. And three of those times that we hear this word religion happens right here in these two verses that I just read to you in James. The word religion points to one's outward worship. Religion is the outward expression of an inward reality. It is the evidence of the Christian faith, but it's not the substance of faith. James is intensely interested in this subject throughout his letter, how the outward behavior demonstrates what really is in the heart. A faith that does not evidence itself in works is no true faith at all. It's dead. It's vain. And it's worthless, James says. Seth taught last week, and I read it, his sermon, that apart from the resurrection of Christ, our faith is worthless. And that came directly from Paul in in, uh, 1 Corinthians 15. James says that an unbridled tongue has the same outcome. It evidences a worthless religion. What we say really matters. 
And the attitude in which we say it really matters. James says that pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this. And when we read passages like this, we need to pay attention to all the details that we can find. And we need to first start, or what I do, maybe this will be helpful for you, in a passage like this, I look at what the verbs are. What is the actions that are being described? Well, there's a bridling. That's a kind of a word that we think about when we think of horses or animals, right? Something that goes in the mouth and, and it does something. I mean, there's a great action in what a bridle does. But I also read this word to visit. Now, visit is a word that means more than just, I'm just going to go hang out at times when I can. If bridle means to firmly control one's mouth, then visit means to purposely go after and seek. It means not only are we supposed to watch what we say, but we're supposed to really go after and seek after visiting those who are poor and needy. Finally, the other active verb that James mentions here, he says that we are to keep oneself unstained from the world, that we are to actively guard our own selves and our own body from an ungodly world or a world that rejects who God is and what God says. So what is James doing here in these critical verses? Well, first of all, he's saying that we may have these outward expressions of religion. I come to church. I heard the word. I have the gift of knowledge. And I'm a great teacher, so I've got to talk a whole lot. But James says that may be so. But if we don't control what we say, if we do not show compassion to the poor and needy, if we do not keep ourselves unstained as we fight for holiness... Our religion is worthless. So that's one thing that James says. Secondly, though, what James is doing in these verses is he's providing us an outline for what he's going to teach us for the rest of the letter. This is a great outline. In chapter 2 that we're about to get into in a moment, he teaches us to be concerned for the poor and needy and especially our relationship with them. In chapter 3, he's concerned with the use of our speech and keeping a rein on it. And in chapter 4 through the first part of chapter 5, he's concerned with our relationship with the world as it opposes God and God's purposes. So chapter 2. What is our relationship with the poor and needy to look like? How are believers to care for others that are in need? And by the way, why does he mix it up, right? I mean, at first, if we look, he says, we've got to control what we say. We have to show compassion to the poor and needy, and we have to keep or guard ourselves right so now he's going to jump though seemingly from the tongue and he's going to go straight to the second one why is it so important that James does this there are many thoughts about this that that other theologians would think about it but what's so convincing to me is that in chapter one he's already the theme has already been that who is the poor and needy we are And who came to us? He did. And so he's already gone through some of that and he's told us, hey, this is what God has done for us. And so immediately it would make sense in that context to turn and say, hey, don't forget, if I've done this for you, you are to be a reflection of me. You need to remember who you are as you go about treating others. So he jumps to that and then he'll backtrack in chapter 3 and get back to controlling the tongue. 
If you're able and you've got your fingers on chapter 2 and James, uh, stand with me and let's uh, read uh, 13 verses here. James says, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there, or sit down by my feet, Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you're committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you've become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to no one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Praise God for his word. You may be seated. So if you're a note taker today, here's where you can take your notes. Here's the outline. James first lays down a principle. No partiality. And then he provides a memorable illustration. Then James gives us three reasons why we must not show partiality. And they all begin with I. Or at least I think they do. We don't show partiality because, number one, it's inconsistent with God's way of thinking. It's insensible, as experience teaches us. And it's incompatible with God's law. Then James concludes this section with a divine remedy. How are we to fix such a problem? One way our religion is defiled is by combining our faith in the Lord with partiality. What is partiality? It's an attitude towards others. It's how we evaluate them. It's how we assess others. It's how we value them. Or how we fail to. It's making distinctions. It's discriminating. It's judging others without showing mercy. The word partiality literally means to receive the face. It's looking at the face of things. The outward appearance. And then it's drawing conclusions based on what we see. And it easily leads to paying special attention to or showing favoritism or even being snobs. We're often impressed by things that God does not find impressive. And we often assess others by different standards than God looks at. Now this is a real testing of our faith as James is already told us and warned us about in chapter 1. When we assess others, when we're impressed merely by appearances, the things that we value become very clear. 
And this reveals a lot about our own character. We think it's looking at the face of them. And it's revealing who they are. When James says, hold on a second. When you act like that, you're actually revealing what your character is. The illustration James provides is not as far-fetched as it may seem. Imagine a young family shows up at gospel. And they have. And they kind of look put together. They seem easy to talk to. They're smiling. They look like stand-up kind of people in the community. And I'm up here looking at them thinking, I've got to go to them and say hello at the end of the service. I want to introduce myself to them. And I want to get to know them. I want to be sure they're welcome. But the question is, do I react the same way to a quiet, single, older guy that maybe slips in the back by himself? Maybe not looking so put together. Show no partiality, James says in verse 1. But notice how he says it. He says, my brothers, those of you who hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Another version says, the glorious Lord. What it means perhaps more simply is the glory. He said, if you hold faith in the glorious Lord, and that's really what believers do, right? That is what we confess, that the Lord Jesus Christ, he who came down from heaven to us, he who visited actively, sought out us, is the glory, has become the glory of, of our very lives. That's the theme of chapter 1. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under the trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life with which God has promised to those who love him. God sought after us. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, James says, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. If that is true of us this morning, that he is the true glory of our lives, and then we glory in the appearance of something short of that, we show partiality. And when we do so, we are in effect saying to other people, you sit here while you stand over there. And James asks, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? This making distinctions means being double-minded, unstable, and wavering. It, in fact, is the very same word James used in verse one, or chapter 1, verse 6. He used it about the doubting man. The one who is wavering between two ways of thinking. When we make distinctions, that's the way we're acting. The bottom line is, when we treat others like this, we are spiritually unstable. And we have forgotten our own spiritual poverty. Doesn't that remind you of Revelation 3 and the description the Lord gave of the Laodicean church? He said, God said to them, you say, I'm rich, that I've prospered, I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. James goes on to give reasons why we are not to show partiality. Look at verse 5. Listen, he says, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him? To show partiality and to treat others by receiving the face is inconsistent with God's character and God's way of thinking. We know that in 1 Sam 16, God said in choosing David 
The Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Even the enemies of Jesus recognize that he showed no partiality. In Matthew 22, we hear his enemies saying to him, Teacher, we know you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. Paul says in Romans 2, Whether you're Jew or Greek, God shows no partiality. And in Ephesians 6, he says, Whether you're a master or a servant, God shows no partiality. And from our call to worship this morning in Deuteronomy 10, the Chad read, For the Lord is not partial. He executes justice for the fatherless and the widow. That's what James is just talking about and telling us that we are to do. And loves the stranger, loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing. Love, therefore, the stranger. For you were strangers once in the land of of Egypt. There there that idea is again. Remember who you were and then remember who you've become simply because God sought you out. He visited you and now he has commissioned his church and his body, James says, to visit the poor and needy, to go to them, actively seeking them out and not showing partiality. It is inconsistent with the Father's character. But it's also insensible. God has chosen the poor in this world. That's by the world's standards. He has chosen some of the poor, but not just the poor. Now think about this. He's not chosen only the poor. Later in this chapter, we read about Abraham. And in chapter 5, we're going to read about Job. Both of these men were men of great wealth. They had plenty and God chose them. Paul writes to the Corinthians, not many of you were wise, not many powerful, not many of noble birth according to this world's standards. He said though, praise God, not many. He didn't say not any or Abraham and Job wouldn't have been included. Why is it divinely illogical? to judge the poor and the needy this way. It's because God chose them to be rich in faith and heirs of his kingdom. Yet you have dishonored the poor man. What James is saying, he says, but in showing partiality, you have shown them no mercy. And on the other hand, why is it insensible to judge the rich in this way? Aren't they the ones who oppress you? Aren't they the ones who drag you? That's the same word that he used in chapter 1 by luring you as as temptation and sin does. It, It lures you along. What he's saying is these men have lured you along into court. These are also the men who blaspheme that honorable name, that worthy name by which you are called. And what is his name that we are called by. Verse 1, it's the Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Lord, the most honorable name above all names. The commentator Doug Moo said this, in the light of God's glory, it is quite insensible. It's foolish to show favoritism based on inferior levels of human glory. And that's true. Rich or poor, no partiality. It's foolish to see ourselves or others in those terms because compared to God, aren't we all poor? Aren't we all needy? Though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor so that we might become rich. To show partiality is inconsistent. It's insensible, but it's also incompatible with God's law. Most simply put, it's sin. We may as well just call it what the Bible does. It's sin and it's breaking God's law. God's law has already been described as the perfect law of liberty in chapter one. That seemed to point to the gospel. We need 
that law. We need the gospel. Here in verse 8, James calls God's law a royal law. And it's royal because it rules over all other laws. Paul said, Oh, no one anything except to love each other. This lovely law, this royal law is royal also because it's the law of the kingdom that we just read about. A kingdom that if we're saved, we are subjects ourselves. And it's also loyal because it proceeds from the lips of the king himself. And here, the law described as the royal law seems, though, now to point back to the Ten Commandments. Deuteronomy 6, we all know this, it tells us that we are to love God. Leviticus 19, 18 tells us that we are to love our neighbor as ourself. Jesus, of course, comes and puts those together. And he says, these are the laws that we are to hang everything on. James here quotes the second part. James could have said, Hey, we are to love God with all of our hearts. But rather than say that, he says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself in verse 8. He picks that second table and he says he uses that. Why would he do that? Because James is teaching about our treatment of others as a reflection of our understanding, our relationship with God. In the first table of the law, we see described in the Ten Commandments, the first four or five describe what our relationship is with God. No other idols, right? Love no other God, serve no other God but me, and so on and so forth. And then in the second table, if you will, he shows us how we are therefore to treat one another. No murder, no adultery, go on and go on. You you know how it works. If we can't get the first one right, we can't even try to understand the second one. That's what James is saying. And it's about then when we have this right, this is a reflection of who God is and what he has taught us. And James touched on that in chapter 1. What a reflection is, is when we look at the man in the mirror. I hope we think of James 1 and not the old song from the 90s. I'm looking at the man in the mirror and I've got to change my ways. We can't change our ways no matter what Michael Jackson said. The truth is it takes somebody outside us to come and to change and bring that sort of change into our hearts and into our lives. James seems to say when we stay there at the mirror and really think about how the gospel is changing us, we should see the reflection of that perfect law of liberty. We should see the reflection of the gospel growing to look more and more like our Father. Yet we fail many times when we're tested, when temptations come and we sin, and showing partiality in verse 9 is sinning for whoever keeps the whole law now there's another description the whole law the law is whole it's perfect but fails in one point he has become guilty of all of it the law is perfect it's royal but it's also whole meaning that it's perfectly complete and it lacks in nothing another phrase james in chapter one has already used We can't just say, well, I got an 8 out of 10, so I passed. Forget about those two. I made it through. It's not that. It's rather like a pane of glass where one chip leads to the shattering of the whole piece. It's like a chain where one link, if it fails, the whole chain loses its ability. And for my kids and other kids in 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 the room today, it's like a bicycle tire. One tiny puncture is going to flatten the whole thing. And that's what James teaches us. The law is perfect and whole because it comes from the one who gave it, who's also perfect and whole. Verse 11 said, For he who said, also said. He said it all, and now we're responsible for it all. 
you say, we're not under the law anymore. We are under grace and praise God we are. Yet if we just stop there, we misunderstand. In Exodus, God first saved his people out of slavery. And then when he saved them and brought them across the river on dry ground, what, what did he do? He took them then to the mountain, to Sinai, where he did what? Where he gave them the law. He brought them to give them the law. The unsaved person cannot climb the ladder of the law. Rather, God gave the law to his people as a pattern for living. And this pattern is a reflection of who God is. The law is for the unsaved because it points them to Christ. But the law is for the saved because it shows us how we are to live. God cares for the needy and the poor. We are to care for the needy and the poor too. And when we show partiality, we sin against God, the one who gave the law. James concludes the section with this exhortation. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. God cares about how we treat others. Because how we treat others is a reflection of how we think about God. When we despise the poor, when we dishonor the poor, we are like the man who looks in the mirror and sees a sinner saved by God's grace and then walks away and forgets who he was. Forgetting that we have been shown mercy undeserved. This is how the gospel works in the lives of those who have been rescued from the bondage of sin. We must never forget who we once were without God's sovereign grace visited us. And we must, with the most sincere thankfulness in our heart, always remember who we are now in Christ. Get that? We are never to forget and always to remember. And when we remember who we are in our lives, mercy can triumph over judgment. And that's verse 13. Mercy triumphs. Mercy boasts. Mercy rejoices over our judging others. Partiality is defeated and mercy wins the day. When we remember that we have been saved by his mercy, we cannot help but to show that mercy to others. To all others. When we recall how the Lord is glorious, we cannot help but desire to look like him. To be more conformed to his image. To reflect his glory in our showing mercy to those around us. All of those around us. Those who have experienced his grace now relate to God's law of liberty in a new way. His precepts have become promises. Take the man who's a thief all of his life. God saves him and he walks in the church and the first thing he sees when he sees the Ten Commandments is what? Thou shalt not steal. Now, as an unsaved man, he can look at thou shalt not steal and he sees a law that he knows he's a lawbreaker. But when God comes in and brings the change that he does, that very man can look at that law in a much different way. Thou shall not steal. You now have been given a new heart in which you don't have to steal anymore. The man who has stolen all of his life. The Bible says, those of you that have stolen, steal no more. You don't have to steal no more because of the spirit that lives in our heart and and lives within us and guides us in a way that as we grow and develop in our sanctification, we can look at the laws that are hard on one end of the scale and look at them and say, but there's freedom now. There's liberty from the conviction of those sins anymore. I don't have to live as a thief. I can live by one who shall not steal. 
There's a positive look upon it. We've been given a new heart with new outlooks and new desires. We've been given a freedom to love and obey him because his mercy is more. And it is triumphed over his judgment of us through the gospel. And that changes everything, including how we speak, how we act. It's the evidence of true faith and pure and undefiled religion. It even changes the words that we believers all long to hear. Then the king said to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father and inherit the kingdom. Jesus says, For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger. And you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And then we ask, how, Lord? When, Lord? When did that happen? I didn't realize I was doing that. Jesus says, truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Don't you long to hear that sort of invitation? Come, inherit the kingdom. You know, I'm thankful when I read these sorts of passages about showing partiality. Seth and I were talking the other day on a, in the car and we were driving. You know, and I said... You know, I know that I am guilty of breaking the law in this way, but, you know, how convicting it is to ask God to say, I think we need to do this. We need to ask God, Lord, show me. When do I show partiality to others? When do I treat others in a way that by your mercy you just never treated me? It's convicting, but it's a blessing because his laws, his precepts to me have now become promises. Not that I can ever do it on my own, I can't. And not even that I do it perfectly now, I don't. But it really does matter that we never forget about what God's done for us. And we always remember who we are because of what Christ has done. God help us to think more clearly and more often about these great truths. Stand with me if you will.